Educating women and girls is one of the smartest moves any country can make. However, an estimated number of 129 million girls worldwide remain out of school and face multiple barriers to education. As the future of work changes with new jobs emerging at the frontier of economies, we can't allow girls to miss out on the skills they need to become effective change makers and drivers of their economies. My name is Nadia Nanaya Awusu. I identify myself as a youth leader and that is why I'm proud to introduce to you the Women and Girls in STEM series brought to you by the Ecobound Foundation and the Global Partnership of Education. This podcast series features eminent speakers from Ghana who will share their insights and perspectives on how girls and young women can be elevated to take up career opportunities in science, technology, engineering, and mathematical fields. Allow me to introduce today's speaker, Professor Nana Jane Opokwajeman. Professor Nana is the former Minister for Education of Ghana and the former Africa Board Chairperson of the Forum for African Women Educationalists. She is the former Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, Ghana. First, we need to begin from the premise that everybody can learn, boy or girl, regardless where they are. But the outcomes depend on the circumstances. If we look back at history of education in Ghana, we'll notice that it didn't quite come for girls. So for a long time, it was the men who are taking the lead in all these subjects, including the STEM ones. So when we talked of an engineer, mathematician, a scientist, technician, they all came up as males. And that has a way of establishing a perception in the minds of people that there are certain things that boys did or that girls couldn't do. And it's a perception, you know, perceptions may not have any grounding in objective reality, but they are real. And they can prevent or support people to do one thing or the other. When we continue, we also see gender roles playing a role. In so far as um, certain roles are expected of girls in the home and so on, they can have a way of impacting their attendance. Once you have a high dropout rate of girls, it means you are not going to see many of them as you move up. So one of the things we need to do is to look at why they drop out and ensure that they go to school, they stay in school, they move up. And you know, girls are capable of studying any subject. So there's no subject that is for boys or for girls. Maybe talking about my own experience, I went to girls' schools for a long time. So girls were doing anything, any of the subjects, and so, you know, everybody. So there was nothing in my consciousness that there was a subject that girls couldn't study. But a very important obstacle, I think, is the way in which the whole subject, or all the subjects that form the STEM, have been so rarefied in the sense that they are removed from the lived experiences of people. And therefore, even though there are many women in science in this country, as in processing food, as in storage, as in distribution, uh, because you don't find this in the textbooks, they look as if we don't find the women in STEM. But the women are in STEM in the informal sector. And we need to feature them and let them be appreciated that yes, what they're doing has a lot to do with science and math. I don't know how you're going to survive in entrepreneurship or even in the markets if you're not good at mathematics. So they do math there, but somehow when we are counting mathematics, we deliberately forget them. And in the end, we have a very poor number of women in mathematics. And you can do that for many of the subjects. Another area that I think we need to look at in order to raise and maintain the number of girls in STEM is to look at how the subjects are being taught. I think that if we focus on a gender responsive pedagogy, we'll have a way of raising the interests of girls. How are they taught? How do they want to learn? If they're already in a subject that you tell them is not for them, are you encouraging them to stay there or to move out? If all they see their science, physics, maths, and so on teachers as males, what impression does it create for them? So you need to make a conscious effort to ensure that you are giving them, I don't want to call them models, but examples of women in these subjects. Another way I think of helping them understand is to maybe isolate them for some clinics. We've done this in this country before. 
science clinics, you know, so that they can understand if I'm a girl and I'm interested in chemistry or I'm interested in physics, what can I do with it? What are the options? You know, who, are, who has done physics and which lady did physics or majored in physics and what is she doing? So we need to expand the economy, you know, so that the science student or the STEM student doesn't find herself in employment in a non-STEM area because the STEM areas are not being opened up in our economy. So you see there's a direct link between what we should be doing in school and what the economy should be practicing. And you know, we need to see how the science, the STEM they are studying is reflected in the factories. Uh, is it reflected in creation of things that we need? You know, is it, is it reflected in the laboratories? If you go to the hospitals and you go to the laboratories, how many women do we see and why that is the case? You know, how about engineering sites, construction sites, all the areas where you need um, people who have specialized in the STEM subjects. And I'm not just talking about using things that others have produced. I'm talking about producing our own. I come from a home where everybody is encouraged and um, you are expected to go to school. I didn't come, come from a home where you can choose not to go to school. It wasn't an option. And I didn't see it as a force. I saw it as something that you are expected to do and you do the best you can. Uh, so it just continued from primary throughout to university. So at university I got a lot of encouragement from my professors, a whole lot of it. And they were males. And today I want to commend them. They really, really encouraged me. And at home too, I think my first encourager was my grandfather, incidentally, you know, who said, oh, you learn all you can, you can learn and so on. I didn't quite understand what he meant. But as I said, I got to the university, I got a lot of support. And I think the beauty of being in, in a university is to study what you want. It was an interesting and arduous journey. As you say, what are the obstacles? Sometimes you find yourself as the only female in a class. You have all kinds of reactions from your peers. But once you know why you are there and what you are doing, those um, reactions or distractions you know, don't become your main focus. And then continuing to graduate school. I went to graduate school outside of the country. So again, you have to deal with not only gender, also race, so many things. But again, it's a question of knowing, why have I traveled so far? Why am I here? And you know that in life, there'll be many, many distractions. But you just stay focused. And in the end, I enjoyed what I was doing. Came back, taught at the university of my life. And um, the rest, they say, is history. I want to begin with the families, and I want to thank them. Listen, we live in a country that believes in education. And the sacrifices that parents make for their children are not light. Some borrow, some even sell family heirlooms. Some sell what they have just to see their children in school or through school. And I think this is worthy of commendation. There are other countries where the government has to scream and yell and so on and to get people to send their children to school. Here we have a country, or we live in a country where people want to go to school. Parents want their children to go to school and they make the right uh, sacrifices. So I want to commend them. And in terms of the younger people watching me, I, you know, sometimes when you are too young to understand what sacrifice anybody is making. You know, you just feel that's the way it should be. And when you are very, very little, you can even decide your father said something you didn't like, so you are not going to school. Because you are too young to understand what this whole thing uh, implies for your future. I want to tell the young people to take their education seriously. You know, I, I want people to enjoy learning. I want people to want to learn. When you want to do something, the distractions become minor. They should take their studies seriously. You know, in school you make friends, and that is very important. But definitely that's not the main reason 
for going to school. Uh, when I was counseling students on the campus, I always ask them one thing. At the end of the day, ask yourself, apart from the lectures that you are ob obligated to go, how else have you spent your time? And this is a, a self-evaluation you do. You don't have to tell anybody. And if you realize that consistently you are spending your extra time away from your studies, then maybe you should review. No, nobody is saying you shouldn't have a social life. But the social life is not the reason. In fact, you can have a fantastic social life away from the campus and have the whole day for it or the whole month. But you are here to prepare yourself for the future and you must also give it the necessary attention. So, um, again, I want to, you know, those of us who've had a bit of experience teaching in other countries or, you know, having all kinds of experiences, I always admire the Ghanaian child and the Ghanaian student. They have a way of being so creative, being so determined, and it is very admirable. You know, on the campus, I know sometimes we don't have the books. We just give an article to the class leader. And the following week, everybody has a copy and they read them. You know, so you don't have to spend time, as we do in other countries, motivating students to learn. They come motivated. They come ready to learn. And I want to admire them for that and tell them to keep up, to keep up with it and, you know, just go along with us and that. It is already well. Globally, women make up only 28% of the total workforce in science, technology, engineering, and mathematical fields. Imagine a world where this number increases, where women are able to pursue their careers in STEM fields without any form of discrimination. That's the world I want, and I hope that's the world you want as well. It's been a lovely journey with you on the Women and Girls in STEM podcast series brought to you by the Ecobank Foundation and the Global Partnership of Education. I hope you've had a lovely time joining all the series. Don't forget to share the videos with your friends and family. Let us know your learnings. What did you find intriguing? We're happy to hear from you. Remember to follow us on all social media platforms. My name is Nadia Nanaya Usu and it's been lovely having you with me. Thank you.